a few of our Kingdom U enrollee students this year. Um, I'm not going to, I might not even talk about KU this morning. I'm going to let these folks talk about KU. Now I want you to be brief and anointed. You know what that means. That means don't preach. I want you to share what, yesterday was the first class of this year. Was it okay? It's okay. Yeah, right. You'll hear it in a second. Off the chain, but I'll let these folks tell you what it, what they glean, what it means to them, and if you think maybe some of these folks need to join you. <laughs> First, um, I will not do it justice. I won't. I won't do it the way Greg did. No. But one of the things that I loved that he said was he was talking about tithing, and how so many times, you know or people, they just feel like if they are expecting something back from the Lord, if they, we bring our money and we bring our offerings and we bring our tithes, that we're not supposed to expect anything in return. I get that, but what he said was, that is not God. That his, his promises are that if you do this, I will do this. And so we are supposed to, be, it, it's okay to expect for God to honor and to to um, fulfill the things that he has promised in bringing his kingdom to us. I don't know where to begin. It's so much. It's looking at life through a different set of lens. We're looking at life as a kingdom instead of just a place we live. Um, we are meant to be kings in the earth. And if we are kings in the earth, then we need a kingdom. It's so, I, I don't even, I can't even bring up. Let me, let me say one thing. The one thing he said to me, I know a lot of people say, well, that was bad luck or that was good luck. He said that the word luck is a derivative of the word Lucifer. So please stop using the word luck. We're not lucky, we're blessed. Okay? Just uh, one thought I'll relay. If you're not signed up, Terry may not say it, but I will. You need to be. And um, the revelation that you will get will take you back. I mean, it'll just take your breath away. And if you look for value in something, somebody asked Greg a question at the end, said, so Greg, how long have you been studying kingdom? And he said, 25 years. And he said, I didn't say anything to anybody for seven he said, because I wanted to understand what God was really saying. So, but then his comment was, but you don't have to wait that long. You know, that's why Kingdom University is here. And so I would encourage you, if you're not enrolled, it doesn't matter if you went through last year, I would encourage you to enroll. Just whatever you've got to do, enroll. Thanks. Have you ever stood under a waterfall stuff is coming down on you so fast and it just it hurts a little but it's still great that's what it was like yesterday none of us felt like we could take notes fast enough and and what was so exciting about it is that we were being shown things that were always have always been right in front of our eyes in the Bible but we're getting new revelation now this is a, a this is a like almost like a christening moment it's it's just not possible to explain it but it's real and it has to be understood so please come if you can
One big thing <clears throat> was being able to reach from the natural into the supernatural. But I'm going to say that one for Terry to let him elaborate on that one. But one thing is a kingdom has to have a king. And when we have a king, we have to do whatever that king says. We're not to question that. We can't be disobedient. So when the king says, get up and pray at 3 o'clock in the morning, we don't say, but I'm tired. We get up and pray. When he says, go see a friend that's sick, but I, I want to do this today. No, no but. You go. You have to be obedient to the king. When you're obedient, then you receive the blessings of living in the kingdom. You don't get the blessings by not being obedient. So the major um, theme we used yesterday was Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If we're seeking him, he says seeking you will find. If we're seeking him, trust me, you'll find him, but you got to seek him with all your heart. Tom, the king woke me up at 2.30 this morning, and uh, I was feeling really good sleeping. And he nudged me a few times, and I finally thought I better get up. So at 5 o'clock, he let me go back to sleep a little bit. But he knows when he can talk to me, and it's usually about 3 o'clock in the morning. I have no distractions then. I can't encourage you enough to be a part of KU. Can't encourage you enough. Uh, yet last year was life-changing for us that were a part of it. And I thought, there's nothing else to be learned about kingdom. I'm kidding. Okay, I'm kidding. Yesterday, it's like, oh, my gosh, we know nothing. We know nothing. We were all just absolutely leveled, thinking, where has this been all of our lives? You know, it's been hidden, but it's up to us to find it. And it's easy to find when our eyes are open. And the lens of religion have been removed. I can, I, I, we all, everybody here I'm looking at and me, have lens of religion still clouding our perception of what the Spirit says. We still do. If you've lived in the West in America, if you've gone to a church, you have religion, and religion stinketh, and it stinks really bad. There's some other words I love to use, but I don't use those anymore. But, you know, you make, fill in the blank what religion is, and it's bad. It's no good, it's harmful, and it's destructive. I encourage you to uh, connect with one of us. Lori's out today sick. But she's the, uh, what is she? Coordinator. Coordinator, thank you. That was a hard word. She's our coordinator for this campus. So connect with her until she gets back. Connect with one of us. Love to have you join us. It was awesome. I think they can sign up through next month is what I've heard. If that's sign up through next month? Yeah, into February you can uh, still register. Okay. It's so good. I got hit by a bug and it wasn't the love bug this week. And I got to thinking, I got slack on some things. I got slack on drinking water. I got slack on my, my zinc. I got slack on my vitamin D3, my C. Why? Because I was just so busy. I'd get up in the morning, i think, well, I'll do it later. And then a day goes by and two days goes by. And next thing you know, in about three weeks, you've done about one day's worth of stuff. But I love there's a scripture in Proverbs that says, if we, don't know, if we don't do what we know to do to take care of ourselves, we're the brother of him who commits suicide. So in these days that we're in, when we don't walk through and just, you know, well, I'm just not going to touch me. Well, if you do things that open the door, the enemy will come in, right? So we need to strengthen ourselves. We need to use every, everything that we know to do that God has given to us with wisdom to keep our bodies healthy, right? And this is... I'm talking to me now. I'm not talking to anybody. And, you know, and then the best you can do, you can, you know, you just trust God, right? But um, anyway, the devil's not going to win, is he? And there's also everything's beautiful in its time, as I mentioned a moment ago. My uh, son's mother-in-law, I think, is in her early 80s. So, I mean, you say, well, she's 80. She lived a long time. I don't think God's people need to go to heaven on a cancer bed, personally. I think you should decide. I think I'm leaving today, Lord. I'll, let, I'll just, bye, Terry, I'm gone today. But you coming with me. So. <laughs> Don't go soon. <laughs> he says, we've got too much debt. Don't go soon. 
<laughs> no, he's not. That's kidding. I'm just kidding. But God has a way, doesn't he? God has a plan. God has a strategy. And strategy is number three. That's the number third, three point. But just a brief review. I think most of you know this. But we began a series on January 1 based on a prophetic dream and a, then a subsequent word that was given to me within just a span of a few hours. And, you know, we're in this season of prophetic dreams and visions. Do we understand that we... I want you to stay tuned. God is speaking, and he's going to speak to you if you have an ear to hear. I know that. I, I've got that on good accord. It's in the Scripture. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. He desires to speak to the church. And he needs to give us... He needs to speak to us for many, many reasons. For guidance. For peace. You know, it says, he who keeps his mind stayed on me, I'll keep in peace because he trusts me. You know how hard it is sometimes to keep your mind stayed on God? I'm going to tell you in a moment how you can do that. Many times we'll think, well, I'm, you know, one minute, and the next thing you know, you're going down the other rabbit hill, rabbit hole or whatever. You know, you're believing everything bad that could possibly happen. Anybody ever have those problems? I know some do because we talk to enough people. But we have to bring our mind. Pastor used to say, bring your mind back. Go out and get your mind and bring it back. And that's what we have to do. It's, it's, a, it's really a, an intentional effort that we have to make to keep our thoughts under control. I'm actually going to be working on a message about our, the power of our thoughts and how they can make us or break us. And they will. But we also said in November that when I asked the Lord, what is the theme for 23? He said, the lion's roar is the theme. And as I told you last week, I thought it was going to be all about warfare. And he said, no, it's not about warfare. It's a wake-up call. It's a revelry. God is wait He's blowing his horn to wake up the church. Yes. Why? does God? Because God needs the church in the world today. The church is the only answer for what's going on in the world. And the dream that was given to Terry is, was that he was shown a hardbound book that was opened in front of him. And the page had a title and appeared to be followed by five or six instructional points and he was not permitted to view the content, but he was allowed to see the first one. And, we, and I believe it was because we had ministered that already the week before. And that first one was order and organization. And every area of our life has to be in order. And he also said that they have to follow the pattern that's going to be given and that he would give to me those last, those last points. So not knowing that he had had that dream or vision, I awoke and heard search out the matter, thinking, well, that's, I know that scripture's in Proverbs. But when we discussed it, we realized that the two were linked very closely. And so organization is critical in our life. And, we, you know, I had taught a message on December the 18th about making room for Jesus, cleaning out our closets. The Lord gave me a dream the next day about you guys coming into my house, cleaning out my closets. And I was so embarrassed because I had so much stuff that I didn't use and had been in there for years I even found some stuff uh, this week looking for some things that I hadn't used and they had all expired. So, you know, we can throw away some food cans that are 2014, right? I probably, that's beyond the, yeah. Yeah, I found that in, in back in one of the cabinets, 2014. Goodness. <laughs> Maybe it was a, a typo. <laughs> no. But the first point of, of having order in our life is critical to start to, because God is a God of order. If we're going to start following the path that God has for us, and I believe what he's giving to us is he's giving to us a blueprint for our life, for victory in everything we do if we will follow these points. He will give us a blueprint for victory. And I believe the Lord is saying that he needs us to be more effective in this season that we are in. He needs for us to be, as a church, more effective. Religion has made the church fat and lazy. Does anybody understand? The re religion is not of God. Religion is not of God. The church has devised religion. God created relationship. God created kingdom. And so Matthew 13 tells us that those who have a fat heart and they're lazy can't he have eyes and they can't see and ears and they can't hear. Does that describe any of us? I know it's not in this crowd because you guys are awesome. So... We have to get our lives organized. And, you know, even in, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, even in the church, because there's a lot of argument, how should church look? He says, let everything be done decently and in order, and it's for the benefit of every person. Decently and in order. And so, that, you know, God is a God of order. 
So as we traveled the next day, God downloaded the remaining points. And last week we looked at the, at the point of posture. And posture, we saw in the scripture, in the Hebrew, anytime that word posture is used, it has to do with divine revelation. So God's expecting us, once our life is in order, we can hear and get that divine revelation. We should do nothing unless we hear the Father say, do it. Jesus, I don't do anything unless I see my Father doing it. How, how intentional would we have to be for that to happen? I don't eat what I eat for breakfast unless the Father tells me it's okay. You say, well, that's a little bit ridiculous. This is what I think. God says, what do you want for breakfast? As long as it's healthy. If he says, if I say, I want Belgian waffles with syrup and ice cream, he's going to say, probably it's not a good thing, right? For many reasons. But, but, you know, we need to use our brain, but at the same time, how intentional? And why would God care? Because he needs us healthy for the work he's called us to do. He needs us healthy. And it's no, it is no pat on the back for a church to have so many people that are sick. You know, we're a full gospel, believe in the word of God, and we've got a ton of people sick today. So we all need to get into our prayer closets and say, God, what do I need, what do, I need to do differently? And the Lord has told me this week, cut out this and add that. Stop doing this. Get a full night's sleep. That would help. Things like that. But last week we looked at Gideon and saw that Gideon had to align his revelation of himself with God's revelation of him. You know, God says, mighty hero. And he said, oh, no, I'm the weakest of the, of the, I'm the least of the weakest. How many of us have ever thought to ourselves, I'm the least of the, the weakest? I can't do that for whatever reason. Because my mama told me I could never amount to anything. Or my school teacher, I never did this. I never accomplished that. I, I fl flunked out of school. God doesn't care about any of that. His anointing has nothing to do with how many degrees you have. Sometimes they just get in the way. I, I heard one time they said it takes you four years to get a degree and 40 years to get over it. So I believe that's about true. <laughs> so posture is all about divine revelation and how God sees us. And the third point that we're going to look at today is that of strategy. And in our English language, we, you know, we look at strategy and we just think about what is strategy. It's a, it's a plan or a series of steps that leads to an end goal. In essence... That's correct, right? But remember, the Lord said, search out the matter. So I immediately went into the scripture, okay, God, where is strategy used? And not very often. But in the ancient Greek, the word strategy, you'll be surprised, is a, is a military term. Maybe some of you know this already. It's the office of general. It's a commander or a generalship. It's the leader or commander of an army or a general. But it's someone who does that. It's the utilization during both peace and war and of all the nation's force, to bring all the nation's forces together to ensure security and victory. That's, the, that's what strategy is. Also in the ancient Greek, around 300 AD, the word meant, it came from the word strategos, or strategeos, which means general. And it says, while the term is credited to the Greeks, no Greek ever used the word. Isn't that interesting? While it's credited to the Greeks, no Greek ever really used the word. This is what the Greek would say for strategy. It was the general's knowledge or the general's wisdom. That's what strategy is. The general's knowledge or the general's wisdom. And who do we know is the greatest strategist of all? We saw this back in December, Isaiah 9, 6. We're told that Jesus is the extraordinary strategist. He is the extraordinary strategist. We should have no strategy outside of his strategy for our life. Now, I'm not saying we check our brains at the door, but that what we, the plans we have should come from God, right? So strategy flows out of wisdom and knowledge, and God is the source of all wisdom and knowledge. Let's connect some dots. So if we're not connected to God, we're not connected to wisdom and knowledge, and we're not connected to good strategy. Does that make sense? This is why the devil can never have a strategy. All he can have is a plan or a method or some kind of trickery. And even in, the, in Ephesians 6 where it talks about escaping the devil's evil strategies, that's not even the right word. It's the word methods or methodia in the Greek. It's not even the word strategy. So it's really, you know, he has to trick us out of our strategy because he, doesn't, he's, he has no source of wisdom and knowledge. So everything he does is based on trickery. He wants to trick you out of your calling, trick you out of your blessing, deceive you out of that. But God has a strategy to get you where he has promised you're going if we're willing to listen. But it starts with that relationship with God, the fear of the Lord. Psalm 111.10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What does fear mean? It means a reverence or an awe. 
I, don't, I think the local, not the local church, the church at large has lost reverence for God. We just do any old way we want to do. It don't matter. We don't honor his name. We take his name in vain. We come into church and we call ourselves a believer and we support everything that's ungodly. Is that respecting and revering God? God says, if you honor me, I'll honor you. And God says, my word is holy. Just like he says, my tithe is holy. But what do we do? If, we, if we're eating up the tithe, we're, we're not honoring God. Daniel 2.20 says, Blessed be the name of God from eternity past to eternity future, for wisdom and power are his alone. So if we need wisdom and we need understanding and we need a strategy, our temptation is to always go to the human flesh before we'd ever go to God. Right? I'm going to go get this plan. I'm going I'm to go get this series. I'm going to go to this conference. What is God? Is God in any of this? A lot of people have good conferences, but they, they just after your dollar bill, that's their strategy. Seriously, we know, we know people that have these in the name of Jesus. And it's all about in the name of my Mercedes sitting in my garage in my 7,000 square foot home. We've seen some of these. We've seen some put on such a show that it was, it was incredible. And then you, when you get to really know them, there's nothing there. It's like, it's like an eggshell that's waiting to collapse because it's, it's all talk and, and no real substance. Colossians 2, 3, but see, in God's strategy, he will warn us of those things. And we should have discernment, right? So don't be going after every get-rich-quick scheme, my whole point. Colossians 2, 3 says, in him, in him, Jesus, lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So all good strategy is going to flow from the knowledge of God, right? And how do we find God's knowledge? It's in his word, right? Well, do you know God has a master strategy? And I think you may have heard this yesterday if you were part of Kingdom U. Genesis 1, 28. We've heard it how many times? We've probably said it at least two or three times a, a month in here. God blessed them. God barocked them. That means he gave them potential for success in everything he called them to do. Every person in here that was created by God has potential for success. It's up to us if we're going to walk in that potential and allow God to make a way and follow his strategy. Too many times we might lose it because we're off doing our own thing. I don't want to do it this way. I want to do it that way. So it says, and God blessed them and God said, now this is what we're all called to do, fruitful. That means it's you, you know, you, what you put your hands to, prosperous, you multiply, you fill the earth, you subdue it, and you take dominion of the fish, the sea, the birds of the heavens, everything that moves except mankind. God never told us to have dominion over each other. But many Christians will say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what my calling is. I just read it to you. Genesis 1.28 is everybody's purpose in life. To be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to take dominion. Why? To expand the kingdom of God in the earth. That's why we are here. We're here as part of God's family. So your vocation, you say, well, I'm a teacher. Well, wonderful. What a wonderful opportunity to expand the kingdom of God. Well, I work at Walmart. Wonderful. The whole world goes to Walmart. That is an incredible mission field, right? You get a chance to expand the kingdom of God. Well, I, you know, I'm a business person. Wonderful. You get an opportunity to go into homes that are never going to come into churches and expand the kingdom of God and show them the goodness of God, the love of God. To, unfortunately, too many people don't like church anymore as much as they used to. They don't like church because church hasn't been good to them or for them. <laughs> it's, it's nice not caring whether anybody likes that or not. <laughs> so, but I know not here I'm talking about. But your vocation or your position in life is your gift that God has given you to fulfill Genesis 1.28. So if somebody ever says, I don't know what God wants me to do, he wants you to. Be blessed. He wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to multiply. He wants you to fill the earth. He's just going to have you do it a different way than he might have others to do it. And I believe that God wires each one of us in such a way with gifts and talents that we have a blueprint for what we're called to do. But that blueprint is still a part of the master strategy, and we have to understand that. So as people fulfill God's master strategy, what does that look like? Well, Jesus gives us a master strategy uh, plan. <coughs> excuse me. And, excuse me one second. Matthew 18. 
I almost told Terry he needed to be up here today. He left. <laughs> I'm going to try to talk a little lower if that's okay. <clears throat> it says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore. Now, if you look at that in the Greek, it means as you go, as you go, you are to make disciples. As you live life, you are to make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you even unto the end of the age. We have become so me-focused and think that God's plan revolves around our goal instead of his. We have, that we've not looked to God for the strategy. We said, God, it's all about me. It's about my calling. It's about my gifting. I know you want to make me famous. We had somebody stand in this church 20 years ago and said God told him he's going to be standing in coliseums and he was going to be famous and all these people are going to be coming and maybe that was true. But you know what? It never happened because it was all about him. It really wasn't about God. And this guy was a minister at the time. Now God can tell people that, right? And that might be God's plan, but what are you going to do? How are you going to handle it? If God tells you you're going to be the... Tom, if God tells you you're going to be the most successful heating and air conditioning or electrical or whatever it is you do, person... How do you handle that? To God be the glory? We can even say that glibly, can't we? God, show me how to use the gifting you have for the kingdom of God. How am I going to, what strategy can I have? So regardless of our vocation or position in life, we have to answer the question, am I fulfilling the strategy of God? Jesus, uh, Terry said that the Lord spoke to him several weeks ago and he said, it's not, we're not called to be fulfilled, we're called to fulfill. You and I are called to fulfill the plan of God. Mark 16 says, and these miracles will accompany those who believe. How many of us does that qualify? These miracles, these miracle signs will accompany those who believe. They'll drive out demons in the power of my name. It would be wonderful if teachers were casting demons out of kids in the classroom. Right? If they believe, they're supposed to be able to do that. It'd be wonderful if they could lay hands on the sick on your job. Somebody get a diagnosis that's not good. You lay your hands on them and they are healed. This is what this scripture promises. Those who believe, these signs will follow them. It says they will be supernaturally protected from snakes and drinking anything poison. I believe that just means danger or damage in general. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. That's the way we're supposed to live our life. So in order for things to be in proper order, we first have to ask how my calling in life is fulfilling, Genesis 1, and Matthew 28. We have to ask that question. And what was the, remember the first thing that Gideon had to deal with last week? What was it? Anybody remember? He had to clean Baal out of his house. He was, an, he was a good Israelite boy. He had to clean Baal out of his house. How many believers have Baal and Ashtra in their homes, in their lives? Well, what is that? I don't have these little idols. This is what it is, immorality and sexual perversion. Homosexuality, gender transition, murdering, sacrifice of children, prostitution. Well, I don't do any of that. Do you? What do you watch? What do you pay your money to see? What entertains you? Who do you vote for? If we vote for people that support these things, then we're in favor of it. We're supporting these things. We've got bail in our house. And we're asking God, God, I just need for you to speak to you. I need for you to bless me. You've got to clean your house out like I told Gideon. You've got to get your house cleaned out. 74% of Americans age 18 to 29 say abortion should be legal in every situation. 74% of our new generation is saying that. 62% of the 30 to 49-year-olds 55% of the 50 to 65-year-olds, and us older folk, 54%. 54% of Christians accept the practice of homosexuality, and that's up 10% from about 15 years ago. Are we hearing what the Spirit is saying? Do we know the Word? Are we walking in God's strategy? See, we're left to ourselves, and what happens? We create a lot of Ishmaels in our lives because this just seemed like the right thing to do. So we create all these Ishmaels and God's over here thinking, well, now I've got to deal with that. He had to deal with Hagar. He had to deal with Ishmael. He had to deal with Abraham's heart attached to Ishmael. God said, that's not the plan I have. See, God had another strategy. 
Are we asking God for a strategy for our life and our house hasn't been cleaned out? And if we don't know who we are, we'll never walk in that identity that God has given us. I keep hitting this thing backwards. So we cannot be effective if our lives are in chaos. And I want to tell you, God has a strategy for each one of us. And if you have a financial situation, God has a strategy to have you out of debt, blessed, that maybe is not something that you would even think of. We have a friend, Kim, who started a popcorn business. Who would ever think of starting a popcorn business? She's doing well, and it's also she's blessing the, the community with the kingdom message. God might have a way for you to, he owned all the gold and silver. He could, have it, he could have you out of debt just like that. But are we willing to follow his plan and his ways? Well, I, I want God to do it, but I'm not giving until he does. Then keep it. If you don't have seeds, because you're not a sower. We heard Dr. Todd Zeiger tell us that. If you don't have seed, it's because you're not a sower. If you want to get out of debt or if you want to get out of a financial crunch, give your way out of it. I'm telling you, it works. We've done it. We've done it. God has a strategy for your family. See, as a family, my marriage is all, you know, God has a strategy. It's found in his word. It's found in his word. And that strategy God had from creation was a husband and a wife. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Why? Because you don't procreate with two of the same kind. See, God's purpose is to have the earth filled with his children, his people. So the devil wants to convince people that this isn't okay. You know, we have just God is love. Well, God is love, but God loves his word more than he loves anything else. He has a strategy for this nation. The strategy is when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. But the devil wants to feed the flesh with control, power, and greed. It's incredible that people can go into a, a position working for us, the people, making $35,000 a year and come out of their position millionaires. Something's not right. There's fraud somewhere. There's theft somewhere. There's greed somewhere. Well, you shouldn't be talking about this in the church. Where else should we be talking about it? The church is what's the reason. The church, is, the church put people like that in office. It's time for the church to wake up. He has a strategy for his kingdom. And that's to be expanded through ecclesia. That is to be expanded through ecclesia. So how do we get that strategy? It begins with the Word of God. We've got to get into the Word. The one thing the Lord said to me back in November, He said, you've got to devour my Word in this new season. His Word is the source of His wisdom and knowledge through Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit will not speak anything does that does not come out of His Word. That was a weak amen, but that's the truth. Listen to Deuteronomy 6. He says, listen closely, Israel. I'm telling you, listen closely, impact. Listen closely, every person sitting in this church that has an issue in your life that you need to have dealt with. If you're bound up with bondage and addiction, you can be free before you leave here today. And that addiction doesn't necessarily have to be drugs and alcohol. It can be food. It can be pornography. You know, about 50% of people who profess to be Christians watch pornography on a regular basis. And we wonder, God, why aren't you answering my call? Well, God knows we're just flesh. He also knows you're not just flesh, you're supernatural. We heard that yesterday. He says, listen carefully, and why? To obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen closely and be careful to obey, then all will go well with you. Psalm 1, 1 and 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is where? In YouTube, in TikTok, in Facebook. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on that law he meditates day and night. Now, I want you to listen. You're going to hear this in a moment somewhere else. But that word meditate is not sitting around here thinking. That word meditate literally means to mutter or to speak. He says, you're to be speaking my word day and night. And this is how you control your mind. What does the scripture tell us in James 3, I think it is? He says, the, you know, ship, there's a tiny rudder controls the whole ship. Well, our life is the ship that God has placed us on. The rudder is our tongue. And when our thoughts control our ship and send us in a wrong direction, we begin to speak the word of truth with our rudder and realign our ship. This is how we keep ourselves on that right path. 
If we leave our mind to itself, it will take us a place we don't want to go. Because the mind is beautifully addicted to whatever you feed it the most. So if you're feeding it negative and defeat and sickness and poverty, that's what you're, where your mind is going to take you. But you speak what the Word says. The Word says, I'm the Lord God who heals your diseases. I'm the God who blesses you. You have the mind of Christ. See, we have to control our ship with our rudder. Jeremiah 6.16 6, says, The Lord said to His people, You're standing at the crossroads. Every one of us is at the crossroads. We've heard this so many times. So consider your path. See, stop. Take a minute. Make room for God. Let Him speak to you. Consider your path. Ask where the old reliable paths are. Ask where the path is that leads to blessing and follow it. If you do, you will find rest for your souls. But this is what they said. We will not follow it. We will not follow it. You're saying, oh my goodness, why would they say that? You ask, look around and let's ask the church world. Why has the church said, I'm not following the path of God? I'm not following the, the ancient paths. Because we want to do things our way. We want to do what seems right. We want to do what feeds our flesh. But it always leads to lack and destruction. So I want to ask you, where are you going for your strategy? And who are you seeking counsel from? Where do you go when it feels like you've got an impossible task in front of you? Does anybody ever feel like you had an impossible task? I could raise both hands. Well, Joshua was given an impossible task to take down a city that had 12-foot thick walls and 30-foot high walls. Now, this was not in the day of tanks and, you know, the, uh, airplanes and bombers and all this. He just had whatever he had, a spear. <coughs> Let's look first at what we see, what we know about Joshua. We know the end of the story, and I'm just going to br briefly go to that. But let, what do we know about Joshua? Number one is that he was no stranger to the presence and the voice of God. How do I know that? Exodus 33 says... Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Afterwards, Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. You say, well, that doesn't mean anything. Well, if we go and look at that Hebrew word, remain behind, and it's the word tavik, and it means to be in the midst or in the middle or the center of something. So even after Moses left the tent of meeting, Joshua hung out in the middle of it. He was no stranger to the presence. Did you ever wonder why Aaron wasn't there instead of Joshua? Aaron was the priest. It would seem only likely that Aaron would have been the one to guard that secret, sacred tent. But remember, Aaron's also the one that fell for the golden calf routine. Joshua 1. What else do we know about Joshua? Joshua heard, knows how to hear the voice of the Lord. And then this is when Joshua is called by the Lord. It says, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. And he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. I've, ta I've taught this so many times, I'm not going to go back. But, you know, sometimes we've got to realize the old season's dead. Sometimes we have to understand that God's done with that. It's time to move on to something new. And see, God has a strategy for the new thing in your life. Can we just sit down a minute? There's so much distraction going on from walking in and out of the sanctuary. Can we just rever God a moment? Ushers, let's get some ushers. If somebody comes out, just let them stay out, okay? This is disrespectful. If you leave, just leave, okay? I love you. I mean it with love. Let me start over. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come. See, there's an appointed time, a Kairos time for you to do what God has called you to do. And I believe for this church, that Kairos time is today. It is today. We were planted in 81 for today. And then it says... It's time for you to lead the people across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving you. I promised, and he said, I'm the same promise I gave to Moses, I'm giving to you. And he said, nobody's going to be able to stand against you. That's the same promise God has. If God gives you something to do, nobody can stand against you. Nobody's in your way for what God wants to do in your life. And then he said, be strong and courageous. Did we hear that last week? Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. 
See, a lot of times God asks us to do something and fear will, call, will rob us of our courage. And what do we do? We back away. We talk ourselves out of it. Or we let someone else talk us out of it. For you are the one who would lead these people. He says, again, be careful to obey all the instruction Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Do we see the plan, God? Do we see the series of steps that God has? You get into the Word. You hear my voice. You don't deviate. You obey it. He says, then you're going to be successful. And only then are you going to be successful. He says, study the book of instruction continually. Study the book of, of, of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night. There's that same word. You speak that word day and night. When you get up in the morning, what are you speaking? Or is our mind just run, taking us to places? We need to speak the goodness of God. We need to speak, God, I thank you for the divine connection I have today. I thank you, God, that I walk in divine health. I thank you, Holy God, that you bless what I put my hands to. I thank you, God, that you give me discernment of those that I meet, that I will know those that I'm supposed to work with and those that are the enemy's distraction. God, I thank you that I have the mind of Christ. You've given to me everything I need for life and godliness. I thank you, God, because I keep my mind stayed on you, you keep me in perfect peace because I trust in you. See, we need to be saying what the word, we need to mutter this continually. He says, only then are you going to be successful. Only then will you be prosperous. Only then will you succeed. So we have to have the word of God inside of us. We have to be filled with the word. And you just ask yourself, how much word are you getting? How much word are we getting? That's for you to de determine, you and the Lord. So Joshua then was, had brought the children of Israel to the promised land, this stepping forward some time. And, and that city that we talked about was Jericho. That was the first fruit city for the Lord. But it was impossible. God, nobody's ever taken that city. Twelve feet thick walls. Can you imagine? Two, two of Terry's thick laying down on the floor. That's pretty thick. Now I'm talking about length, not width. But sometimes God will ask us to do something that seems impossible. Why? So we can learn to trust him and also that we can learn to do war. So Joshua goes out and he looks over the task at hand. And this is when it usually gets us, you know, when God says, now go look at what I want you to do. And what do you do? Oh my gosh, Lord, you can't be serious. You want us to go into the school with all these kids and they're suicidal and they're depressed and they're on drugs. Who in the world could reach these kids? It's impossible. But I know what we'll do. We have a plan. God says, no, you just leave your plan on the shelf. I've got another plan. And this is, what, this, is, this is what happened to Joshua. He says, when Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him and a sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and demanded, are you friend or foe? And neither one, he replied, I am the commander of the Lord's army. Most commentators think it's, this was God himself standing in front of Joshua. What do you want your servant to do? That was Joshua's answer response. God, what do you want me to do? We get up in the morning, God, what do you want me to do today? Or is our calendar so full that we say, God, now I can work you in here about 1.30 for about 20 minutes. Or, I, you know, maybe between 7 and 7.30 I can work you in. Because I've just got all these important things that I've got to do today. Right? What do you want your servant to do? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. What God was asking Joshua to do was impossible in the natural. But see, that's, what, that's the way God works. Unless it's so impossible that it requires God, he didn't give it to us. I can tell you that. But God showed up at the right moment, but then he did something even worse. He gave him the most unrealistic strategy he could possibly give him. I'm sure Joshua was thinking, you're just going to breathe on these people like you did the Red Sea. You know, you know, that's the other thing. God usually doesn't ever do the same, anything twice the same way. But Joshua probably had, I mean, I got the king, that, the, you know, the Lord of the armies here with me. He's just going to breathe on it. It's going to fall down. And this is what he said. He said, now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or out. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho. See, God's already given it to him. It's king and all his strong warriors and you and your fighting men. Listen to this. This is God's strategy. March around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you're to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing their horns. And when you hear the priests give one loud blast on the ram's horn, have all the people shout as loud as they can. 
And then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. Now, who in the world would believe such a strategy? But we just sang that song, The Lion's Roar. What does it say? Our voice is shaking the earth. See, the voice of the people obedient to God was shaking the earth. God will tear down walls for us if we'll be obedient to him. And God gives us impossible tasks because unless, God, unless it's impossible, anybody could do it and take a lot of credit for it, right? What about a New Testament example? This, I, want to, I want to conclude with this one. This is one of my favorites. And I'll tell you why in a moment. But Luke 5. Has anybody ever felt like God just asked you to give it all up for him? I remember in 1997 when the Lord said, you're through with your career in, in the chemical corporate America. You know, for some reason I had an incredible amount of faith. I guess God just gave me a shot of faith because he probably figured this girl is not going to make it on what I'm getting ready to tell her to do. But he says, it's time to leave. And so I turned in my resignation, six-figure income, pretty close to it at that time. That was a long time ago. And carrying all our insurance because he was self-employed. You know, we're just taking all the perks with it. And then God says, just lay it aside. So I turned in my resignation, and my boss said, you must be out of your mind. You've been in this industry for 25 years. All these people know you. Why would you give this up? And I thought, if I have to explain, you would never understand. And he wouldn't have until the last day. But God provided. God provided. What was God's strategy? Within three weeks, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Well, that wasn't in my plans. I figured God had some big ministry thing for me to do. But I had the breast cancer diagnosis. And I'm thinking, God, we had a conversation about this. That if there was an issue with the medical, well, you know, just let me know and we'll just kind of hang on, keep on going. But God said, no, I'm enough. I'll take care of everything. I ended up, I don't think we ever had to pay anything. We ended up with one surgeon bill of about 10, 12, I remember now. And he just looked at me and he, he was a believer. He went, every year he would go into Africa and work on children with cleft palates. And he looked at me at the end and I said, oh, again, I can figure out some way to pay this thing. And he said, no, I think you've had enough to pay. I'm writing it off. Never solicited it. It was just God's favor. See, God will take care of you if we trust him. God will take care of us if we trust him. All this loan forgiveness that people are getting, that's wonderful. But I just hope God's in it because otherwise we're paying for it, right? So anyway, Luke 5, verse, I got a little sidetracked, a little rabbit trail there. But God might ask you one day to give it all up, to surrender everything. Actually, he's already asked you. Sometimes it doesn't just mean walking away from a job. Sometimes it's just walking away from your own ideas and plans and dreams and goals. It says, one day as Jesus was, pre uh, was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the waters. So he sat in the boat and he taught the crowds from there. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. But master, Simon replied, We worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat and soon both boats were filled with fish on the verge of sinking. And when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell on his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please forgive me. I'm such a sinful man. Have you ever asked why Jesus would ask these men, he said, you're going to be fishers of men, to follow him? You think about what he asked them to do. He said, I want you to let down your nets. This was daytime. Fish, did, fish didn't come to the surface in the daytime. They knew. They, these were fishermen. They were tired. They'd been there all night. Nothing had happened. But why would Jesus ask these men to leave their livelihood and follow someone into ministry who was really pretty radical at that time? He opposed all the religious structure that was in, in the country, city, in the nation. And he said, I want you to leave everything here and I want you to follow me. And I remember thinking to the Lord, this was about a few months back. I thought, God, that's pretty selfish of you. <laughs> Y'all talk to the Lord like that. That's pretty selfish of you to expect them just to walk away and leave their family, you know. And then the Lord said, well, why don't you do a little research? Why don't you search out the matters, what he was saying? So this is one of my chapters in my new book that just went to the publisher this week. So y'all pray about all that.
He said there's a little scrubbing and editing to do, but then we'll get it done. But I asked God, I said, well, how much were those fish worth? Or God asked me, how much do you think those fish were worth? So I did a little research. I searched out the matter. And this I found in Academia EDU by Shelley Hauser. And this is an incredible article. She's a mathematician. She's got pages of calculus and all these quadratic equations and all these geometric designs. And she calculated how much those fish were worth. So it says, Ms. Hauser determined that based on the size of the two boats and the price of fish and the wages received in that day, that each of the four fishing partners received approximately 25 years worth of salary from that one haul of fish. 25 years. Does God take care of us or what? Was Jesus just blessing them for the use of the boat? No, you guys, I'm just going to rent your boat for a day. By the way, here's 25 years worth of salary. No, Jesus had a purpose for the men, and he offered to them a new life assignment and a new season. They would now become fishers of men. They would now become fishers of men. Who was going to support their family? God said, I'll take care of your family. God never never sends you into your new season empty-handed. He will never do it. You might go out with two empty boats, but you're going to come back with a haul if God is in the boat with you. That's a great chapter, by the way. I'd like for you to read it sometime. I went into all the Greek and the Hebrew and tore the words apart of what it really means to be, a, you know, in what they, how they look at boats. But anyway, it's pretty interesting. So God has extended a call to each one of us to work within his master strategy, and that is to disciple. God only cares about people. And he doesn't care what we do as long as we are fulfilling the mandate, the strategy of making disciples of all people. See, our fulfillment is not in how well we sing, how well we preach, how well we teach. Did God show up today? Did people's lives get touched? Or do we just follow some religious protocol? We came in and, like we said, we went, to our, we went through our routine. And we left and nothing happened. Nobody changed. That's not what God is all about. Joshua was called to go through walls of a city that were impenetrable. But God had a strategy. See, God knew physics. I even read one, one physician, or no, physicist, not physician, physicist said one time, calculating the number of people that was marching around that city and the vibration and the impact it put into the earth. And here again, all these calculus equations but said it took those six, six days of walking around, the sound and the vibration of the sound is what caused the walls to collapse. See, Joshua probably didn't know those laws of physics, did he? He didn't know those laws of physics, but God knew them. And sometimes we don't know yet what God knows already. We may not even understand the scientific laws, the financial laws, but God knows it already. The disciples were called to abandon it all. They were asked to fish where they'd fished all day or all night. And they knew better than Jesus. They knew how to fish. But he said, nevertheless, we'll do it. See, he had a strategy. Because I believe long before that day began, Jesus had made a call into the depths of those waters to call those fish out at a certain time to fill those nets. God's made a call on behalf of every one of us. And it's out there. And he's waiting for us to throw out our nets and trust him and say, God, I want your strategy. I want your will. I want your plan. Let's stand if you would. You know, there's so many examples. Actually, I had some I took out just because of my voice and the sake of time. But there's so many examples in scriptures of those who followed to the T God's strategy for their life. And there's also examples of those who didn't. King Saul was a great example of that. See, it said when he was small in his own eyes and he thought he could learn something from Samuel, he was good. But when he became not so small, he went on the wrong track. As we look through Scripture and we look at these people, we see they all had one thing in common as they knew how to hear the voice of the Lord. Number one, you've got to hear the voice of the Lord. We've been saying this for months. You've got to know how to hear the voice of the Lord. Number two, is your life in order or is it total chaos? Number three, do you understand who you are? See, God sees you as a mighty person of valor. He sees you as gifted and talented. He sees you, he sees you accomplishing great things. We've got to quit believing what mama told us or 
the teacher told us, or our friend told us, or our ex-spouse told us. You got to know that God will supply to you everything you need. Can we have faith long enough just to understand and seek God? God, what is the strategy for my finances? What is the strategy for my family? I'm not, you know, we, I'm going to this financial planner. I'm going to. That's okay. But is God sending you to that financial planner? I think God's probably a pretty good financial planner. If you go into a financial planner and you're not participating in Malachi 3.10 plan, your, your financial planner is not going to help you any. <coughs> a little rough. But I hope you got the point. I hope you understood the point. We've got to seek the strategy of God in everything that we do, even the small things in life. If you've got, how many's got lost kids or grandkids in here? Anybody? God's got a strategy for them. Let God do it, okay? Just let God do it. We don't have to get them on the phone and ask them all the time what they're doing. <laughs> I remember when our son left home, went out to Arizona, first time, this is 25 years ago, I guess. Uh, every time he'd call me, I'd say, did you go to church Sunday? <laughs> and I'd feel the walls go up. And he's, he would be dating some, you know, I'm dating this person. I said, are they a Christian? He said, I don't know, Mom. You pray on my, my life so fast I can't find out. I said, and I'm going to continue. <laughs> but then he called and he said, I found the one I'm going to marry, and we've decided to find a church to start our relationship on. And they're very active in their church, and he loves God. He's following his dad with quiet time in the morning. He says he gets up every morning about four just to spend quiet time with the Lord. That makes a mama's heart proud, doesn't it? See, we've got to make time for the Lord. We've got to be able to hear his voice. But trust God with your prodigal. You let the glory of God flow through your life. I'm telling you, God spoke to me. He said the glory will be like a magnet and draw them back. They've got to see something in us they want. We haven't shown them a whole lot. We need an apologize, to apologize to them, actually, for what we've given them, what we've dumped in their laps. We've made them think that what we, what we call church is what God would have for them to do. That's not church. That's not God. I want us just to spend a moment as the team sing. I've asked them to sing the song, Yeshua. I want us just to worship the Lord. And then we're going to move into a time of communion to seal what we have said today, but I want you to think, God, go back through the first two. What is out of order? What is my identity? How do I see myself? Am I saying what you say about me? But number three, God, am I really looking for your strategy? Am I wanting to do it my own way?